Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel, Colinati. Today I'm going to talk about Threshold, the first volume of the collected stories of Roger Zelazny. This is only volume one out of a six volume set. I do not own and I have not read the other five, but I will hopefully be able to eventually as I get my hands on more of these. So I'm not going to talk about the stories in here in great depth. I am going to talk about the three major very famous stories that are in this, but mainly this is just going to be an overview of what type of collection this is. Now, I have been reading Roger Zelazny for quite a while now, and I am a fan of his work in general, especially his style and the way that he uses language and symbolism and lots of illusions and stuff. I think it, he has very interesting and snappy stories that I, I really like. Um, I first read The Chronicles of Amber by him back when I was a kid. I reread all 10 of those books in the very early days of my channel. I think I still have a few videos up on that, including an overview of The Chronicles of Amber as a whole. Um, I think I've also done a review, a very old and kind of crappy review of um, This Immortal, which won a Hugo Award, I think, under the name and Call Me Conrad. And I've read other various things by him over the past couple of years, and every once in a while I just really feel like reading Zelazny, like his work just hits the spot. So I finally felt in the mood to read Threshold. This very heavy hardcover 500 page book has been sitting on my shelves for three or four years and I've always wanted to get into it, I just didn't make the time. So I finally read it. This first volume focuses on the earliest works that Zelazny published from his very first published story in 1962 through a whole bunch of stories that he had published in 1963. And I think it ends with a, a story that was published in 1965 or 66. So it is um, the first five years or so of his career before he started writing novels, I believe. Um, all the stories have um, notes from Zelazny, if he ever commented on the stories, what he thought about them, what he was trying to do with those stories. And then there are usually a very lengthy notes section after each story which explains some of the more esoteric vocabulary that he uses and a lot of the allusions and references that people wouldn't get if, for example, you're like me and don't necessarily understand all the biblical imagery and things like that. Zelazny's style is very sharp and fast and it is usually heavily peppered with allusions and references to various religions, mythologies, literature, and, and a lot of symbolism and meaning packed into very few words. So for me, I didn't necessarily need to rely on the notes so much to understand the words, but there would sometimes be these more subtle veiled allusions to things that I did read the notes to find out if that really impacted the overall meaning of the story because sometimes it's hard to really get that impact if you don't understand the subtle things that Zelazny is doing. Like there are definitely layers to his work, which I think is something that I often miss and I think other people might miss if you're just reading it for the fun surface level. There are usually more things underneath the surface. This um, also surprised me because it has a lot of poetry in it. I did not realize that Zelazny wrote poetry. Apparently in university he aspired to be a poet and eventually gave up that dream when he realized that being a science fiction author would probably pay more <laughs> and be a more viable writing career than poetry. Um, but this has a lot of his poetry that he wrote in the 50s and 60s. Um, he actually repurposed a lot of his poetry in his, in his short stories and in his novels. Um, so if you come across poetry in his stories, it's very likely that he wrote it himself. And I have to say that I, I actually enjoyed some of his poetry quite a bit, um, but apparently he gave up really writing poetry after the 60s, so I don't think that the future volumes in the series will contain as much of that. Um, 
So let's talk about the stories in here. This volume contains his first three really famous stories. They are The Rose for Ecclesiastes, which was published in 1963. It was actually one of the earliest stories he wrote. It wasn't published until a couple of years after he wrote it, and it's the one that basically kickstarted his career. That's the one that I've been most interested in reading from this because I've heard about it so much. Um, it is basically about a very arrogant, unlikable poet who goes to Mars and gains access to, I don't know, kind of like the inner sanctum of the Martian people's society and literature. And basically, they are, the, the Martians are doomed to die. They can no longer reproduce. But he falls in love with and has an affair with a Martian woman. She becomes pregnant and he comes to the Martian matriarch and says, don't you realize this can save your people? You can interbreed with humans so you can survive in some way. And they say, no, thank you. And the woman who like had this affair with the poet uh, basically doesn't care for him, doesn't want their child. I didn't really like the story overall in the sense that it just didn't really thrill me that much, but I was surprised by the final decision. It just didn't end the way that I thought it would. It kind of subverted the cliches a little bit. Um, I also thought the main character was really unlikable, and the saving grace of that is that he's intended to be unlikable. And there's a note from Zlazny in here that says he doesn't like the character either. That was the, the intention. The next really famous one in here is one of my favorite story titles ever. It is The Doors of His Face, The Lamps of His Mouth. I have always wanted to read this story because the title is just so freaking cool. Um, it is a, a biblical reference, kind of a, a paraphrase reference to a passage in the Bible. And this one surprised me most because the actual story was nothing like what I thought it was going to be. It's about a man who joins an expedition to capture a gigantic leviathan in the oceans of an alien planet. Um, he, his specialty is basically acting as bait and baiting the leviathan so that it will emerge from the depths. Um, the expedition is being funded by a very rich woman who was formerly romantically involved with the man, I believe. And just this whole hunt for the sea monster, this leviathan coming up from the crushing depths and everything, it was not what I expected. I really liked the scenario. I did not connect with the characters or what they were feeling and what they wanted at all, unfortunately. And then the other really famous one in here is a novella called He Who Shapes. I had not been aware of this one. I didn't remember the title of it when I started reading it, but I think this is the one that won a Hugo Award. Um, Nebula Award in 1966. This is the longest fiction piece in here, and it is about a man named Render. His name was one of those particularly Zelazny choices. It's such a perfect name for this man because it can mean one thing and also its opposite, to render, like to create, but also render, to tear apart and to destroy. Render is an expert in basically creating immersive dream experiences for people to experience um, as part of therapy. And he is approached by a woman who is blind and wants to be trained in the same profession. He initially says this is impossible because she is blind, but he agrees to um, help her become acclimated to seeing things in her head so that she's not um, shocked by the experience of visual input initially. It doesn't go very well. I think this is the one that is kind of modeled on the um, romantic relationship between Isolde and Tristan, uh, which is not a tale I am that familiar with, um, but it is also a great example of how in many of these stories Zelazny um, is constantly switching up his his style, his voice, his tone, his mode, and the um, shape of stories. He will 
um, challenge himself to write in a very different way, in a very different style, perhaps in all in dialogue or with no dialogue at all, and frequently modeled after works of literature or plays or something that he very much admires. So that building a lot of the core relationships in He Who Shapes on a Legend is very much Zelazny's thing, I think. Um, I found He Who Shapes to probably be the most engaging, especially for its length, out of all of the famous stories in this. Um, I'm not sure that I agree so much with the almost um, love triangle-like thing that happens in it. Um, the notes from Zelazny in here say that he specifically chose to have the main characters be two women and one man because he had never written that before. He'd always just had like two men and one woman or something. Um, so I thought that one was very interesting for how it uses the concept of dreaming and therapy. It recalled um, Le Guin's The Lathe of Heaven immediately for me. Of course, the the world itself is not being changed by the dreams, but um, the characters become very trapped because they cannot necessarily differentiate between what is a dream and what is reality because the experiences seem so real and they are just mentally being so messed up by it. Um, I think it also um, is one of the earlier stories I've ever read that talks about the effect of rapid technological change on people's mental health. It's basically said in the story that many people have had issues with these and, and seek out therapy because um, the, the world is giving them anxieties and stresses that it didn't once have, which is something that really resonated with me. It's uh, something that we're talking about now with like millennials and being the most stressed and anxious generation because of the immediacy of the world and the problems and the technology and everything. So that one ended up being uh, the most interesting out of all the stories for me, though I think that it lost me a little bit by the end because of the confusion of what is real and what is not. I felt like the what actually happened to people was more symbolically described and I wanted it to be a little bit more concrete <laughs> because once again, I do frequently read Zelazny on a more superficial level. I don't necessarily get all of the more subtle things that he is doing, and that's more on me as a reader. It does mean, I think, that Zelazny's stories can be very, very rewarding upon multiple rereads as you learn all the clever things that he's doing and it starts to snap into place. So. Threshold. I really enjoyed reading this. There are dozens of other shorter stories in this that I read as well. None of them were necessarily things I have any commentary on, but I just enjoyed them as a whole. I also learned more about Zelazny as a person. There's a lot of biographical detail about him in here. Um, I think the introduction and then a whole piece at the end go over his life and um, the early stages of his career in great detail. And I had known some of that before, um, but like I said before, I had never known about his poet phase or anything, and that was very interesting. Do let me know if you've read Zelazny, maybe if you've read any of his short stories and what you think about them. Um, I haven't come across that many people in um, booktube these days who's actively reading Zelazny um, now, so I don't have many people to talk to about him. So if you have any comments, leave them down below. Thank you very much for watching this super stream of consciousness babbly type video, and I'll be back to talk to you again soon, and until then, bye.